terrible disease is passed from generation to generation. Now parents can break the cycle. One in 30 individuals carry cystic fibrosis genes. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. Welcome to Secrets of the Sequence. I'm Lucky Severson. Genetic research involving human embryos has provoked a running controversy, muted now and then only by the dominance of other news. Curiously, this storm has all but passed by a field of applied genetics that also involves human embryos and raises some of the same questions. The process of embryo screening known as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD is an expensive procedure offered by a small number of fertility clinics. Some say PGD is a doorway to designer babies, but for now its use seems mostly benign. We've seen patients who are not coming to us for infertility per se, but they're coming to us because they've had a child with a significant abnormality and they wish to have further children and prevent having uh, the child with that abnormality. Before we go any further, I think we need to review just how such affliction inheritance works. Let's go to our all-knowing, ever-ready computer. Lucky, genetic diseases are linked to either dominant genes or recessive genes. In the case of a dominant condition, only one parent must carry the gene. The child has a 50% chance of inheriting the abnormal gene copy and getting the disease. However, most known genetic diseases are caused by recessive genes. In these cases, both parents must carry the abnormal copy of the gene in order to pass it on to their offspring. A child has a 25% chance of inheriting the defective gene from both mother and father. PGD can eliminate that risk altogether. PGD actually is a high-tech extension of the in vitro fertilization process. The first step in the process is to stimulate the ovaries with hormones to produce multiple eggs. After the eggs have been mixed with sperm, the cell begins to divide and subdivide, replicating itself. On the third day of development, uh, we will do the embryo biopsy for the pre-implantation genetic component. We tease out one of the cells. So if you have a typical eight-cell embryo, which is a good healthy embryo at that stage, you can gently remove one of those cells through this biopsy hole. The single cell is then fixed onto a slide and sent to the genetics laboratory uh, for further analysis. One major use of PGD is to check for chromosomal abnormalities. An odd number of chromosomes is bad news and can lead to miscarriages or to disorders like Down syndrome. The other kind of abnormality screened for is called the single gene defect or mutation. One in 30 individuals carry cystic fibrosis genes and therefore one in 900 couples are at risk of having a baby with cystic fibrosis. Uh, there are many, many similar single gene defects which are less frequent but nevertheless, you know, very severe diseases. Blood tests had told Maria and Rob McLaughlin that they were both carriers of the genetic mutation responsible for cystic fibrosis. They had lucked out with their first child, but they didn't want to gamble with the second. Like any parents dream, you know, care about how tall or smart your child is, you care about how healthy it is, and that's all that we were, you know, cared about at that point in time. This time, PGD was recommended by their fertility specialist, Dr. Jamie Griffo, at the New York University Medical Center. Dr. Griffo says it's far better to diagnose before rather than after pregnancy when abortion is the only alternative. This is a much better alternative because we can make the diagnosis before the pregnancy starts so the patient can avoid that uh, termination procedure. Nine months later, a perfectly healthy Carolyn McLaughlin was born cystic fibrosis free. Having Caroline was, you know, yet another one of the greatest joys that we'll ever know in our lifetime. I will never forget saying to Dr. Griffo that, you know, he was, is a miracle worker for our family. But these miracles don't come cheap. PGD can cost a good deal more than many families can afford. For a couple to go through a standard in vitro fertilization is about, in our program, about $8,500.
and medication adds on average about another three and a half thousand dollars to that cost. On top of that, the PGD procedure is approximately four thousand dollars. And it could cost even more. Only about 40% of implants result in pregnancy. Some couples must go through the procedure as many as four times before succeeding, or calling it quits. There are some who would take exception to the preemption of crippling and life-threatening disorders. But there are other choices PGD offers now that are even more ambiguous. Sex selection, for instance. Many practitioners draw the line here. And we've had a you know, very easy discussion on sex selection, basically saying that it's not our mandate. You know, we're not here to, uh, to do family balancing or sex selection. We're here to treat medical problems. If there was a couple who carried hemophilia as a gene, which is sex selected, you know, we would transfer the female embryos to prevent an affected male being born. The primary objection to sex selection is not its medical, but its social consequences. Francis Fukuyama, a member of the President's panel on bioethics, points to the results of sex selection in some parts of the world, even without IVF or PGD procedures. In Asia, you know, this doesn't use a pre-implantation uh, diagnosis, but there's been sex selection through simple uh, use of sonograms and abortions, and that simple, cheap procedure has led to a surplus of boys over girls of up to 20% you know, uh, in, in countries like uh, China, South Korea, India. So these individual choices, I think, can have disruptive social effects. It is estimated that in a few years, some 90 million Chinese men will be unable to find wives. And what about designer babies? Embryos chosen or genetically engineered for things like intelligence, size, and athletic abilities. At this point, it's impossible to select for IQ or physical characteristics. Um, I don't think it's that far away. I mean, you know, when the genes are characterized and markers are uh, identified, it would be theoretically possible. My guess is five or ten years. Uh, that would be feasible. That's purely a guess. Surely the most controversial use of PGD would be what we might call designer disability. It's been reported at different times that uh, couples who are deaf want to have a child who's deaf. Doctors might say, we won't do that. Uh, we're not going to create a child who has a dysfunction intentionally. We're not going to create any baby who would wind up being worse off as a result of intervention than uh, they would be if no one had done anything. But Francis Fukuyama believes that may not be enough and some form of governmental regulation will be necessary. It's really, you know, the whole body of the people that have to decide the uses that science is, uh, is, is put to, and it can't be delegated to the scientific community. I think it's, it's uh, people through their democratic institutions, their elected representatives and the like, who have to you know, debate among themselves what, what are good and bad uses of science. My personal belief is that some regulation is desirable, because I don't like the idea of the possibility of a maverick uh, group opening up across the street saying, you know, we're going to work on the genes for, you know, eye color and hair color and heightened athletic ability and, you know, try and attract people to do crazy things. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.